that one amazing word, hallelujah. You know, I just love it because it is recognized in so many languages. The word hallelujah, praise the Lord. And I'm so thankful, I was thinking a while back how, because God loves us so deeply, and what amazes me is that before I came to know him, uh, growing up and as a troubled teenager wondering, Lord, there has to be something better than this. And, and all the while he was working in my life to bring me to a point where I would get to meet Emmanuel, God with us, and to receive him into my heart. And I just thank him for that. You know, this time of year the, where the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts and he is love. And I love him for that. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you knew that the time would come when you would send your son to die for us and then to rise again on that third day to live forever, interceding for us. And we thank you that your, your love for us never ends. It never grows dim. It will always be the same, and how I thank you for that today. Father, we do pray for our friends and loved ones, wherever they may be today. We know, Lord, that there are so many that are scattered around the world that are facing difficulties. But, Father, with your spirit within, our brothers and sisters in Christ, wherever they are and whatever difficulties they may find themselves in today, we thank you that your spirit is more than enough for each one of us and how we thank you that your power is not diminished simply because there are millions and millions of brothers and sisters in Christ around the world today. And Father, I would pray as they listen to your word, as they read it, as they listen to it, Father, may it go deep into each one's heart and just do the changes that you set it out to do because we do need your word. It is so valuable, Father, to us in our daily lives. And we just look forward to this time now, Father, for what you have in store for us. Your greatest gift, Lord, is your love for each one of us manifested through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his blessed and precious name we pray. Amen. Merry Christmas, church. Merry Christmas. Feliz Navidad. Uh, Feliz Navidad, yes. How are you doing, Mark? <laughs> well, um, we are down to our fourth Sunday of Advent. And so before we get started on that, uh, I do have some announcements to just kind of cover. Um, basically... Uh, all our activities that we have in church uh, at this time um, are going to be on hold until the beginning of the year. So our typical Friday men's uh, Bible study, of course, that will land on Christmas Day. Um, I doubt any place is going to be open for us, so <laughs> we're going to postpone that. Uh, ladies' Bible study and all that, all those activities, and uh, including um, the um, uh, Wednesday night uh, is on hold until the beginning of the year. So... Um, so with that, uh, just a reminder, um, Thursday is uh, Christmas Eve and Friday is Christmas Day, so if you have, are like a typical man, uh, you need to know that because usually we wait till the last minute and we probably haven't even started our Christmas shopping yet. So it was probably a good idea just to get that reminder out to you guys. You look kind of stunned, Trevor. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, you better get going, man. I just want to let you know, okay? All right. So, anyway, uh, just a reminder for folks. Um, again, just go through the, the regular, uh, you know, announcements of tithing. Uh, you can send, if you want to mail in your tithe, you can send that into uh, LBC at P.O. Box 7212, Lakeland, Florida, through 3807. Cash apps, of course, uh, you can send that through 863-209-2280. And, of course, you can uh, use our website, uh, and there's a link on there for Tidely. Uh, those that are here today, of course, we have the box in the back, just a reminder of that. Uh, and also, don't forget to pick up your Christmas cards in the back. 
okay? Because uh, generally what happens is that those boxes get really full. And uh, we have to constantly remind folks, and especially at times when, you know, like at the beginning of the year we have, uh, you know, tax returns and stuff like that, or the tax statements, that is. Uh, you do want to pick those up, check your box, make sure that you're picking up your stuff, uh, and, and that way we can keep that under control. Um, just a, uh, a little nightmare to announce for folks that have brought kids today. I do have some cupcakes with lots of icing, tons of sugar, so please help yourself to that. I don't want any of those cupcakes to remain. Uh, I want them to disappear by the end of the day, so uh, feel free to help yourself to as many. There you go. All right, buddy. Juice up, man. Juice up. All right. That's good. All right. So one birthday when you announcement, we've got Elaine. Uh, happy birthday. is going to be on the 22nd. Uh, and with that, we'll talk about our Christmas Advent. This is, uh, just a reminder, this is our fourth Advent. Um, so the first Advent was, of course, the Advent of Hope. And if you were following along with your Advent read, Okay, if you have one, you'd be lighting your first purple candle. The second Sunday was the Advent of Peace. Again, you'd be lighting your second purple pan, uh, candle. The third Sunday was the Advent of Joy, which we covered last time. You would be lighting the pink candle. Today, you would be lighting your purple candle, which is the fourth Sunday in the Advent of Love. One of the greatest things is love, faith, hope, and love, right? There is one candle to light that would be remaining. It's the white one. On Christmas Eve, that's when you light your light, your white candle. And so that's if you're following along with that. Um, so at this point, let me talk about the advent of love. Um, there. In our modern understanding of the uh, Christmas story, the birth of Jesus was a touching event with barnyard animals and a shepherd's adoration. But from another perspective, the countdown of his life was on, for ultimately God had sent this child into the world for a greater purpose. The reading from Luke, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 10.10. 10. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, John 3.16. Jesus had been born through a virgin by the Spirit of God, making him both the Son of God and the Son of Man, which put him in a completely unique position. Being fully human, he could be tempted in every way as we, and touched with our feelings and infirmities. Yet being fully divine as, he, as well, he could and did overcome every trial of life. This makes him our champion in a very special way. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. Because Jesus never sinned, he could offer his life in a place of sinners. But it would take all of his love for this to happen. His soul was greatly troubled, and he was agonized over the sacrifice he would make. But through the cost was truly great. But though the, the cost was truly great, his care for us was greater still, so that he gave himself freely to redeem us all reading from Isaiah, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 5, 6. Jesus loved us with everlasting love and has washed us from our sins in his own blood. But the same passage, uh, oh, that was Jeremiah 31, 3, and then Revelation 1, 5, if you want to re reference that. But in the same passage, passage offers a challenge. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
Isaiah 53, 1. For God requires each of us to believe the testimony that he has given his son and put our trust and to put our trust in him. After Jesus died, he rose again on the third day as the prophets foretold. After his resurrection, he appeared to many witnesses who had seen the prophecies come true in him. Many of them wrote accounts of his life, of his loving sacrifice, of his resurrection, and what he meant to us through these. As the season of Advent unfolds and Christmas Day draws near, our sense of anticipation awakens while the world falls deeper into darkness. The true light is already shining in our hearts. The risen Christ ascended into heaven and we again wait in hope for his imminent return. With the inner peace and joy he gives, we look to a day when he will wipe away all of our tears and we will know a love that is perfected in his presence forever. So as we go through these advents that we've gone through each Sunday, hope and the peace and the joy and the love, where this is all building, is that perfect love that Jesus had for us, that God had for us, that he was willing to give his only begotten son for our redemption, for our forgiveness of our sins. It's not because we deserved it. It's because he loved us. Merry Christmas. Good morning, everyone. Susan, are you taking kids? Are you going to take kids? Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you, and good morning, everyone who are joining us on Facebook. Well, you know, I had actually planned to share a different message this morning, but since Pete has been uh, thoughtful enough to enlighten us about the Advent candles and its significance, which is uh, typically been something that is observed with more traditional churches. Um, this has been a commemoration of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, the churches that I've been uh, involved with through my 40-something years of being a Christian have uh, never really observed the Advent candles and the wreaths. A couple of them on occasion, but uh, this is something new to me, but it's a wonderful tradition. And so since Pete has uh, brought us in touch with the theme of love today, I thought that I would bring a message today about the love of Christ that would be the fourth Sunday of Advent since it represents love. At the very heart of Christmas is the love of God. In fact, God is love, 1 John 4, 8. He repeats it again in verse 16, that God is love. That's one of his attributes. We all believe that and we know that. But unfortunately, that is one of the attributes about God that many people question. It's, um, it's something that they they don't understand, and, and because of a lot of things that, go on, that happen in the world, they question whether God is really a God of love. And sometimes even Christians will question whether God is a God of love. They see bad things happen, and they wonder, how could God be a, a God of love? This whole thing with the pandemic, COVID-19, so many people have died and so many people have suffered and, and have lost their jobs. How is, is it that God is a God of love with so many people suffering because of this? Or why does God allow so many natural disasters with things like hurricanes and earthquakes? And we could go on and on and talk about the tremendous suffering of the human race 
that seems to be so contrary to the very idea of a loving God. Because those are the kinds of things that God could easily prevent. But he doesn't. And then there are crimes that people can commit against the innocent. Think about the shootings of children. And people see those things happen and they wonder, why would a loving God allow those things to happen? Or, or terrorism like 9-11 and so many innocent people whose lives have been snuffed out. Or the persecutions that we've been looking at of Christians that are dying because of their faith. And we can explain that God didn't do that. But for a lot of people, that just doesn't matter. Because he still let it happen. And then there are a lot of people, and maybe some of you here, and some of you that may be watching online, you wonder, if, if God is a God of love, why doesn't he love me? How could he love me? I feel so unworthy. And so we have to ask the question, how can we believe that God is a loving God? How can we know that God loves somebody like me? How can we know that God actually loves the world. When we talk about God being a God of love, what is it that really can prove to us that God does indeed love the world? And that's what Pete introduced us to this morning. The very reason why we know that God is love is the reason we celebrate Christmas, the incarnation of God's Son. Many people believe it's a fairy tale, but it is a historical fact. It's not just something that you find in the Bible. There, is, there are extra biblical documentations that prove that Jesus Christ was a real historical figure. And God sent his son to earth to show us beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is love. And God's love for us is so great that he was willing to sacrifice his own son in order to reconcile us to himself so that we might enter into a relationship with him. And I pray that when we're finished this morning, that those of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, when you wake up Sunday or when you wake up Christmas morning, that your heart will, will be overwhelmed with gratitude and joy. Because of the love that you've experienced because of your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because you understand you know what that love has accomplished for you and if you've never experienced the love of God before and for those of you that may be watching online if you've never experienced the love of God my prayer for you is that you would Come to understand that God would open your eyes to see how much he loves you and understand what his love for you has accomplished. And that God would open your heart to receive the fullness of his love that is offered to you in Christ. So let's pray together as we begin and then we will explore the scriptures and see what we can learn about the love of God. All right, let's pray. Loving Father, I want to thank you that while many people may question your love, there really is no doubt in, in my mind, in my heart, that you love us with, a, with an everlasting love, an infinite love. And many here and many that are listening 
know of your great love. And so, Lord, we humbly ask that the Spirit of God may speak to hearts that, that long to know that they are loved, that long to understand the great love of God, that need to know that they are forgiven. So, Lord, we ask that you might fill empty hearts with your love, with your grace, with your mercy, and with your truth. And Lord, we would ask this together, that you would speak to us for the sake of your, your loving son, the one who gave all for us. We ask it in his name. Amen. Well, after John states in verse 8 that, he's, that he is love, he adds this in verses 9 through 10. He alludes to the incarnation here. Look what he says. He says, in this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, I want to look at these verses sort of as an introduction for our main text, which is going to be John 3.16. But there's a couple of things about God's love that I want to point out from this text. First of all, I want us to understand that this really is written for believers. So, having said that, we need to understand that this is to give us a sense of assurance of the love of God. God doesn't want us to worry about whether he loves us or not. He wants to be absolutely confident. He wants us to be sure that this love is something that, it, that we can rest in, that we can enjoy, that we can be settled in. But there's also an element of this that is aimed at unbelievers. There's a wooing. There's an appeal. It's almost like an invitation that while this is written to believers, it's written sort of as an invitation to, to say, hey, this, this, can, this can speak to you too. You too can enjoy the love of God. You can enter into this relationship. So this is an appeal to those who have yet to believe and have experienced the love of God in Christ. So keep that in mind. Keep listening. Secondly, God's love acts first on our behalf. Christmas, or, or more accurately, we might say the Incarnation was when God the Father's love began to move into action by sending the only begotten Son into the world. But notice here, he did it for us, that we might live through him. In other words, Jesus was sent by the Father so that we might have eternal life. Now we'll say more about that a little bit later on. But God acted first. He initiated this love. Thirdly, he points out that we didn't love God first. In this is love, he says, not that we love God. In other words, the whole thrust of what he is saying here, and as a matter of fact, in all the rest of Scripture, is that we are incapable of loving God first. <laughs> we can't love God first. The Bible says that we are actually dead in our trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2.1. Ephesians 2 tells us that until God breathes life in us, we can't believe. And in verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians 2, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So in other words, because of love, he decided to show his grace. Grace is unmerited favor. He didn't have to give us eternal life. He didn't have to breathe his spiritual life into us. But because he loved us, he showed us his grace. He gave us eternal life as a gift. So love for God never starts with us. He loves us first. Verse 19, as a matter of fact, in 1 John 4 says, We love him because he first loved us. The fourth thing we need to understand from this text is that God's love sacrifices for us. He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now that word propitiation means to satisfy God's justice and wrath. God's a holy God. And our sin, we are all sinners. Anybody here ever told a lie? then you're a liar. <laughs> Anybody here ever stole anything? Ever cheated? We're all sinners. You ever disobeyed your parents? There's none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. Every one of us are guilty before a holy God, and our sin has separated us from God. And we could not be reconciled until his holy justice was satisfied. Now, the interesting thing is, is that every other religion requires that some sacrifice for sin is made. But Christianity happens to be the only religion where God himself becomes the sacrifice. And so... God says he sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice that satisfied the holy demands of a righteous and holy God. And so only in the Christian faith does God become the sacrifice. So now, let me try to explain this here by using myself as an example and trying to connect it with the, with the holidays as, as we know them. First of all, Jesus, God the Son, he came at Christmas. He was born, and he lived a, a perfect life. He never sinned for some 30-odd years. He lived his life perfectly. Never did anything wrong. Can you imagine that? Never disobeyed his parents. Never violated the law of God. For 30-some-odd years... He was obedient to his parents and he was obedient to his father in heaven. Then we came to a time that we know as Good Friday. Where he was crucified. Where he hung on the cross. And because he was without sin, God took my sin, God took your sin, and he laid it on the sinless sacrifice, the Son of God, who paid that debt, that sin debt, who satisfied the holy justice of God and paid the price. He took my sin and he laid it on the Son of God while he was on the cross. And my sin debt was satisfied. And to prove that my debt was canceled, Jesus was raised from the tomb three days later. On the day that we celebrate that we call Easter. Or, or Resurrection Sunday. And because Jesus was the propitiation for my sins, I now stand before a holy God, justified, righteous, holy. Now, understand that this is not a righteousness of my own. The righteousness that I have now before a holy God is a gift. It's a righteousness 
that comes by faith. I'm declared righteous. And because now I am righteous, I am perfectly righteous before a holy God, I now am the inheritor of eternal life. I know I'm going to heaven. Not because of anything good that I've done, not because I deserve it, not because I've lived a perfect life and a righteous life, but because I have been given the gift of life through Jesus Christ the Son who paid my sin debt. And you know what? He did all that for me. And there was a time in my life 40 years ago when I wanted nothing to do with him. There was a time when I would curse him and curse God and mock his people. And he still loved me. He still gave himself for me. He did that for me and he did it for you. And if you're watching online, he did it for you too. None of us deserve his love. We don't deserve his grace and his mercy. We don't deserve the eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. But his love has offered that to you. And that's what grace is all about. Salvation is a gift that comes to us by way of his incredible love. Now, I don't know about you, but we could right now just proclaim the benediction and go home and just rejoice until, sun, until Christmas morning and just shout hallelujah the rest of the way until we get there. Because Christmas just confirms to us how much God loves us. Now, and I hope you understand that oftentimes when I preach, I'll refer to you who are listening as loved ones or beloved of God. Because we are. We are the recipients of the, of the infinite Deep, deep love of our good and gracious God. God's love is so wondrous and awesome, and that's one of the reasons why we celebrate Christmas. And Pete reminded us of that this morning. And there's no better verse in all of Scripture. In John 3.16. It is probably the most well-known verse in all of Scripture. Thanks to Tim Tebow, it's even more popular. Because uh, in one of the championship games... He put the verse on eye black, and 90 million people Googled John 3.16. <laughs> of course, thank God his team lost last night. Roll Tide. <laughs> but... Uh, this verse is a, is a verse that I've preached on several times throughout the last 30 years of ministry. But you know, it's so rich. And, and I've, I've reworked it, I've tweaked it, I've added to it, I've changed it. There's a, a, an outline that I developed a few years ago, and I've added to it and changed it a few times. Because this verse is just absolutely packed with divine truth. John 3.16. Read it aloud with me, would you? For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I don't know about you, but I love that verse. I'm sure many of you do too, if not all of you. But do you realize that in that one verse, in that one simple verse, is the full scope of God's love expressed in the gospel? Now, I preface this verse with 1 John chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10, because there were a couple of things I wanted to highlight in addition to what we find in John 3.16. But John 3.16 is an absolute goldmine of truth for us. You know how when you go to a jewelry store, and if you want to look at a diamond or some jewelry, they will lay it on a, on a board of black velvet? Well, John 3.16 is, is kind of like that against the backdrop of the blackness of our sin. <laughs> it really sparkles and shines when you look at our condition. And it accentuates the brilliance of God's love. So I want to look at this kind of break it down bit by bit. And see, first of all, the source of love for God. Remember, the Bible says that God is love. Verse 7 says that love is of God. And since God is our creator, and it stands to reason that love has to come from him, But, uh, you know, we can't really understand what love is apart from God. And because of our sin nature, because of our fallen condition, we can't really understand fully what genuine love is. It's tainted. So we have to go to the perfect source to find out what real love is. And his love is so completely different from our own concept. But God's love is an active, selfless, sacrificing, caring commitment that acts to seek the highest good on behalf of the one that is loved. And, uh, and any and every expression of genuine love finds its source in the God of love. And we love because God loves us. And we love one another because God loves us. And we are born of God because God loves us. Any capacity for us to love has been given to us by God the Father, the one who is love. That's why when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, the first fruit that's mentioned is, is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It comes from God. Human love apart from the Spirit is selfish because of our sinful nature, but He enables us to love with the selfless kind of love. So He is truly the source of all genuine love. Then secondly, there's the magnitude of love. So loved. You know, it's amazing that little word, so. It's hard to imagine how one simple word can be so expressive and full. How much does God love me? How much does God love you? How much does God love the world? Well, so much that he would do the unthinkable, that he would leave the glories of heaven and come to earth as a man. So much that he would allow his own heart to be broken, and while he's on the cross, he would cry out, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. So much that he would die and suffer a cruel death for a sinful human race just so that we could live forever. 
It's interesting that little word, so could also be translated in the Greek in this way. And in this way refers something to something that was stated previously. And so if we go back from verse 16 to verses 14 and 15, look what he says here. And as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now in Numbers chapter 21 and verses 5 through 9, the children of Israel are being judged. And God sent serpents and they're biting all the children of Israel. And they're dying. And so God told Moses in verse 8, he said, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall, be, it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. And so all the children of Israel had to do was look at the snake, an act of faith. As Moses lifted it up, all they had to do was look at it, look and live. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, that was a sermon that Charles Haddon Spurgeon listened to by some little Methodist preacher out in the middle of nowhere, and it was look and live, and that's what he did. Looked and live, and he got saved. Isn't that right? Well, was it Spurgeon, right? <laughs> and he got saved. Look and live. And it was connected to Jesus lifted up on the cross. Look and live. And all they needed to do was look and live. So John is telling us that just like God made a, a way of deliverance for Israel... In the same way, God loved the world and he made a way of deliverance from sin by sending Jesus to be lifted up on the cross. And all we need to do by an act of faith is we look to Jesus and, be lift, and, and live. He used an Old Testament picture to paint a New Testament truth about salvation. Then thirdly, the reach of love is the world. Now, God didn't wait for the world to turn to him before he sent his son. Remember, the world can't. We can't. It's impossible. There's none righteous. There are none to turn to God. The world was still in darkness, even as the world hated him. The world here is the word, word cosmos, but it refers to the entire fallen mass of humanity. But I need to add a word of warning here. God's love for the world is not unconditional. His love moved him to send his son, yes. But he is angry with sin. And he will judge sin. He will punish sin if his son's sacrifice is rejected. As a matter of fact, if you go down to John 3, verse 36... He says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. So the one who rejects the Son of God will have to pay the penalty for their own sin. But God loves the world, and it is why that Jesus said that we must go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Because God says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God says he takes no delight in the death of the wicked. And for that reason, we find number four, the cost of love that he gave. That's what love does. Love gives. Love sacrifices. It thinks nothing of itself. I think of, of the Apostle Paul's commands to, hu to husbands in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Or I think of the words of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 15 and verse 13. Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. He gave up more riches than you and I can ever imagine. Here he is, the, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, living in splendor 
in, in the majesty of, of heaven, and he left that to come to earth for 30 some odd years. He gave that all up and then came to earth on a rescue mission to save us. And what he experienced with the accusations and the brutality and the beating and the whipping, the scourging, the crucifixion, he didn't deserve any of that. But he went through all of that to fulfill his mission. And then he died one of the most painful forms of execution man has ever devised. And it says he loved us. He gave himself a ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2, 6. So the cost of love, God gave his son, and the son gave himself. So Christmas is about God offering his own son for a world that was in desperate need. Number five is the personification of love. His only begotten son. Jesus Christ is unique. He came to earth to flesh out that love. And he loves us perfectly, without fail. So if you're wondering what love looks like, look at Jesus. He is the personification of love. And now don't think love is mushy. He wasn't a wimp. When it came to dealing with sin, he was a man's man. When he dealt with the Pharisees, he called them out for their hypocrisy. When he saw the money changers in the temple taking advantage of people with their greed, he took a whip and he drove them out. When he confronted sin out in the open with people, he called them out. There was a woman caught in adultery. And he told her right out, he said, Woman, go and sin no more. But in grace, he told the rest of the crowd that wanted to stone her, said, all right, which one of you is without sin? Go ahead, throw the first stone. <laughs> he was loving and courageous when it came to dealing with sin. I don't think his manner would set too well with the permissive morality of the cancel culture of today. But he didn't hesitate to call out sin. And he knew when and how to be loving and gracious. And his love was absolutely selfish, or selfless, rather. So he's the embodiment of love for us. If you want to know how to love somebody else, then follow his example. God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave himself for us when I wanted nothing to do with him. Number six is the invitation of love. That whosoever, whoever believes in him. Because God so loved the world, he extends this personal invitation. That if Mike believes in him, that if Jennifer believes in him, that if Julian, that if Cindy, that if Don, Pete, Kayla, Frida, if any of us believe in him, we shall be saved. And it's an open invitation. If you think you're not good enough, you're right. <laughs> that's, that's true. None of us are. That's what's so amazing about grace. We aren't good enough. But God 
is loving and gracious enough. And the invitation still stands. If you're honest and humble enough to admit before God that you don't deserve this, he wants to offer it to you. Love opens the door and bids us to enter. And love invites us to believe and it offers us the gift of God's son. And with him comes life and forgiveness and healing and hope and purpose and promise. But now with all the invitations, they ha there's an RSVP that comes with it. It has to be accepted or rejected. It's like any other gift. If I offered a gift to my wife, I could hold it out to her and, 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 until I die. But it will never be hers until she takes it from my hand. Jesus Christ holds out a gift to us but it will never be mine until I receive it. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God. It's an invitation. And you must respond one way or another. I remember when Pastor Arnett shared the gospel with me. We got to a point in, in his sharing with me at the end of that meeting, he said, all right, Mike, what are you going to do with Jesus? <laughs> His point was, are you going to receive it or reject it? And praise God, I received it. And I hope you're here this morning because you've received it. And if you've never received it, I trust that, that you will. And if you haven't, I would plead with you that ask that you would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the promise of the word of God. Then, number seven, there is the deliverance of love. There's two things that will happen. Number one is the deliverance of love that you should not perish. Now, here's where we have to mention again that we desperately need God's love because God hates sin. In verses 17 and 18, John clarifies the whole reason that God sent his son. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So understand this. Jesus doesn't condemn anybody. And so when we go out and we talk to people about Jesus, we're not going out there to condemn anybody. That's not our place. That's not the role of an evangelist. We, we, we don't share the gospel to condemn anybody. Because what Jesus says here is that people are already condemned. Jesus said, I came that you might have life, that you might be saved. He came to keep them from being condemned. He goes on to say, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So the purpose for which God sent his Son into the world was not condemnation, but salvation. When Jesus died on the cross, he bore the anger and wrath of his Father against sin. The first three hours, he suffered under the hands of men. The next three hours, he suffered under the hands of God. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That moment he was bearing my sin and he was bearing your sin. He took the full punishment. So that God can love us unconditionally. Because we are in Christ. And Jesus bore the wrath of God on behalf of all who believe. God's wrath should have fallen on guilty sinners like us, but instead it fell on him, the innocent son of God. And Peter tells us, 
For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. You're the unjust. So that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. He absorbed every, every last drop of his father's wrath against our sin, though, so that those who believe in him have nothing to fear when we die and face God. And Jesus has saved wicked people like us from the punishment that we deserved. So in essence, what happened was we swapped places. He gave me his life. He took my condemnation. And loved ones, hell is a real place, but it was not created for men. Scriptures say it was created for the devil and his angels. You know, and, and, and hell is not a place that we really like to talk about at Christmas time. But if we're going to talk about eternal life and the gospel, the gospel is only good news because there is bad news to consider. And the truth is that anyone who has not responded to God's invitation to believe in his son will face the judgment of hell because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is the gift that must personally be received if I am to be delivered from punishment and condemnation. Not just believe, but receive it. The gift is now mine, and I am his, and he is mine. And when I receive it, I am delivered from hell. Then last of all, not only am I delivered from hell, but I have the promise of love, and that is the gift of eternal life. I have everlasting life. John says this. I could ask Peter to quote this, because I know he's memorized it. <laughs> but I'm not going to put him on the spot. But this is the testimony that God has given to us, and this life is in his Son. He who has a son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God. That, my friends, is the wonderful promise for anybody who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who has received the gift of eternal life. Once we put our trust in Jesus Christ, God bears the responsibility now of keeping the, me. You see, I have eternal life, and my hope of going to heaven no longer depends on my ability to live the Christian life anymore because I've already been declared righteous. My hope of going to heaven now is based on God's faithfulness to keep his promise to me. I'm in Christ. I'm clothed in his righteousness. I stand before him dressed in his righteousness. And I'm clinging to the blood of Jesus Christ. He's washed me. He's taken away my sin debt. He's paid it in full. My salvation no longer depends on my ability to live the Christian life, but on the faithfulness of, of God to keep his promise. He who has the Son has life. So my question is, do you have the Son? And if you have the Son, you have life. And that is why John 3.16 is such a wonderful verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Should we doubt God's love, my friends? If we do, we need to remember that God chose to love us and to redeem us, knowing that it would cost him the life of his son, Jesus Christ. On the cross, the love of God is in full display. 
He never promised that we would be delivered from life's problems. But he did promise he would be with us and that he would never leave us nor forsake us. God demonstrated his love for us. And Jesus said, greater love has no man in this than a man lay down his life for his friends. And it all began at Christmas. God had to become a man first. So I trust that uh, this Christmas you will uh, find great reason to rejoice. Let's pray together. Our Father, how grateful we are for the love of God that was shown to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. First made known by the Incarnation, how your Son came to earth as a baby. Lord, the Incarnation, we, we can't even understand that. Our, our feeble minds can't even grasp that, how God could enter into a womb, much less be a man. But Lord, we, we want to thank you. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for giving us your son to pay our sin debt, to give us life, to give us hope, to give us peace and joy. All these blessings that Pete has reminded us of through the Advent candles each each week. Lord, we rejoice in God our Savior, and I pray that as we as we awake on Christmas morning, that our hearts would be so filled and overwhelmed with gratitude and joy and peace and hope and love. Lord, that we would be quick to bring you honor and glory in everything that we do. Father, bless us, we pray. And, and for those that are watching on Facebook, I pray that you would extend your blessings to each one who is hearing the sound of my voice and that the Spirit of God might encourage each heart. And uh, Lord, that you would uh, just somehow that you would that you would somehow bring the, the understanding and the, the sense of your great love in perhaps a way that they may have never experienced before. And so, Lord, we want to give you thanks and praise for our time together this morning. And we bless your name. We love you. We thank you for all that you've done. Dismiss us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, those of you on Facebook, again, we want to thank you for joining us. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Lord willing, we'll see you next week.